Mosaic's Community Life Podcast, Life in Canada. Hope you are enjoying the summer. Communities and businesses are opening up, but we still need to be vigilant of the COVID-19 Delta variant. My name is Jane Teasdale, one of the co-owners of Mosaic Home Care Services and Community Resource Centres. I would like to introduce our guest today, all the way from across the pond in the UK, Tara Keck an American-British neuroscientist and professor of neuroscience and Wellcome Trust Senior Research Fellow at the University College of London, England. I first met Tara through the International Federation on Aging on the Global Cafe Zoom, where Tara was doing a presentation on this topic of isolation and loneliness. I was interested in her discussion, as Mosaic has been doing work on the importance of social connection, community and health and aging in place, and also community mapping. We know that loneliness and isolation is one area we need to address in our communities. The World Health Organization, WHO, is looking to do some research in this area. So welcome, Tara. It's a pleasure to have you, and I'm so happy that you're coming on to Mosaic's podcast. I was wondering if you could provide us a brief synopsis of your work and research papers within the UK on neuroplasticity in relation to aging and your work under the UNFPA on healthy aging centers in Bosnia. And before I go into some detailed questions later on, thank you and welcome. Thanks, Jane. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, So... In my lab, we're interested in plasticity or how it is that our brains change in response to the environment. And plasticity is an important part of our entire lives. It's critical for forming new memories, um, but it's also critical for recovering from injury, something like a stroke, um, and key for the adaptation for the use of hearing aids or other sensory aids as we interact with the world. And so we're really interested in this in the adult and aging context. And so more recently, we've taken work sort of taken our work from the lab and thought about it more practically in the real world. And so we're look, we've been looking at aspects of lifestyle that can promote healthy aging. And we've been working with the United Nations Population Fund, or the UNFPA, as well as the Partnership for Public Health in Bosnia and Herzegovina over the past few years um, to look at outcomes from local healthy aging centers that they have there. And these are day centers where people can come in and do activities and they were sort of looking to see, you know, how beneficial are these for society? What are the expected medical outcomes? And so from that study, which was published last year, um, we found that many people were attending these centers four or five days a week and they had a lot of benefits. They were all exercising more than average. Um, They had healthier lifestyles in general. But even though they were coming to these social centers, they were still reporting that they felt lonely. And so we started, decided to really focus in on that. And so we've expanded our project and we're now in the middle of a follow-up study. And we've been looking at loneliness in older people, um, not just in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but across the Eastern Europe and Central Asia region. Um, And this region's of interest because both they have lower birth rates, like what we have throughout Europe, but they also have migration where people are moving into Western Europe. And so they have a very aging population relative to a lot of other countries. And so this new study on loneliness is happening in six countries at the moment, and we're looking at the degree of loneliness, the associated causes, and risk factors. And our hope is that we'll be able to design interventions for loneliness that can be then implemented in these communities with older people. Wow, that's a lot lot of work, but all groundbreaking and, and certainly very important, especially, I mean, again, we're dealing with mental health, loneliness, Uh, loneliness from the COVID-19, I mean, prior to that, but even more so now. Um, And how do people get connected? You're you're absolutely correct. So Tara, how do you define what healthy aging looks like? What does that look like to you? Yeah, I I really like this question. So I think that what's important is that it, it means to me, at least that as you're aging, and as you reach, you know, 60, 70, 80, you're still able to do the things that you like. So aging obviously comes with some slowing down, Um, But we still want to be able to do things that make us happy, make us feel connected, um, bring joy into our lives. And so in addition to sort of still being able to do certain things, you know, maybe we're not going to be able to run as fast as we once did, but we could still take part in a community 5K, right? So things can still bring us joy. 
The second thing that I think is really key is that we want to be delaying aging-related diseases as long as possible. So some of this is under genetic control, but somewhere between 35 and 50 percent of aging-related diseases, if you're talking about something like dementia or Alzheimer's disease, does have lifestyle factors in it. And so what we really want is, you know, if you can, if you have genetics that sort of predisposition you to certain aging related diseases, if you get those diseases at 85 instead of 75, that's 10 great quality years of life that you've had. And so it's, it's this combination of still having an active and engaged and happy life and also putting off anything that's going to take away from, from that life, lifestyle um, as long as possible. No, oh, amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, another important question that I'm posing to you, how can communities and governments promote healthy aging throughout the world? And do you think collaboration is key in communities, professionals, hospitals, local agencies and private organizations working together for the benefit of the older persons? And what things do you see that need to be implemented or addressed within our societies? Right. So um, that's a lot of question. I'll start with yes. the beginning of it. So how do, how do communities and governments promote healthy aging? And um, I think the key thing is, is this needs to start early in life. So we want to build healthy physical, healthy mental, and healthy social societies. You can't suddenly one day wake up, say, I'm 70, and now I'm going to be healthy, right? Like all of this takes time. And setting up, um, particularly if we're talking about social, setting up social, social infrastructure that where, as you age and people come in and out of your life and you have major life events, that that is still there is important. Um, maintaining health and well-being both physically and mentally throughout your life is key so that when you get to these ages, you are putting off um, – sort of complications as, as long as possible. Um, and so what, what we really want communities and governments to be doing is to be incentivizing this and actually making it easy. Um, and so when we think about collaboration in communities, professionals, hospitals, local agencies, I mean, obviously, a lot of this you do want coming from the government, you want community infrastructures, you want support for that. Yes. Um, but then there's a lot of, you know, a lot when we're talking about loneliness or actually many other aging related issues, identifying older people in need, if they're socially isolated or if they aren't an active part of the community, like that's going to be neighbors who notice um, people who are very local. It's not necessarily the hospitals who are going to notice this until someone shows up. And so there's a huge um, aspect for the community in helping identify people who need additional support, but then also in providing that basic support. So when we start thinking about, um, different levels of support, both physically and mentally, you know, the community can go a long way for keeping people in a, a state of general well-being. We can get to the point then when we're sick, where we either have, you know, mental illness or physical illness that we need to go see a doctor. But well-being is something that by having support in the community, activities in the community, places where people feel like they belong in the community, it can be quite beneficial for creating sort of this, this overall state of well-being for older people. That's right. And I think, you know, a lot of community agencies, you know, around the world, uh, in your neighborhoods, through church groups, through uh, senior programs are trying to, you know, connect people either online now during COVID or hopefully <laughs> going down the road face to face. Um, you know, even people, I think some research has, has noted that even people going to large buildings or to senior centers still feel kind of lonely um, and a bit isolated when they're going to programs. So um, I think a lot of people, perhaps with mental health or older persons, they feel more comfortable, I think, in going into smaller groups. And, you know, we've seen this through Mosaic Home Care, where obviously we can't have larger groups in our center. And what we found is that people have connected, you know, through our programs, which have been going on for 10 years, and now have started connecting with those people that they have become friendly with. And now they're doing things outside of Mosaic, you know, connecting for teas or walking to the park or uh, special occasions. So it's it's quite interesting to see how a community is formed within a community as well. Um, I think as well, I just wanted to ask you about ageist attitudes. Um, you know, that have become institutionalized in community structure and planning. And, you know, we do need to change this. Um, any thoughts regarding this? Yeah, so this is an important part, especially as we, you know, come on to loneliness. Um, so 
The WHO just released a report together with the UN on ageism and the effects that it's having um, throughout the world. And I think that's a really critical report and and has sparked a lot of discussion. Um, And I think that ageism is something that we need to think about both for older people and for younger people, because, you know, how do we age with dignity? How do we create intergenerational fairness? How do we make sure that everyone in society is supported? And that's, that's critical. We can't it, it becomes problematic when, when one generation is pitted against another. That's, that's not really helping anyone. Um, but when we then start thinking about things like loneliness and what are the barriers to, you know, going to this activity or that activity, I think, you know, feeling like you're too old or too young or that you won't fit in is something that, you know, it's just an additional barrier that if somebody was a little bit reluctant to begin with, then you take and, you know, think, oh, well, this is something that people who are in their 20s do or people in their 40s yes. do. Uh, I'm in my 60s now, so it's not appropriate for me. I think it just adds an additional small barrier that, you know, somebody who may have been able to go out and find something that they really enjoyed maybe maybe just takes a step back and, and doesn't quite um, quite do that in a way that they would have otherwise. And so I think that we have these sort of little micro things that, that shift people's behavior. And then obviously there's structural things that are happening um, globally and differently in different countries, but where ageism is inherent to the systems. And that's something that we need to really be looking at at a level of governments and and, yes. and laws and things like that. Yes, I, I agree. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'd like to hear, you know, any information on personhood and person-centered care, how, you know, Mosaic feels very strongly about this. We've done a lot of research within this, have done um, presentations within the UK uh, through the European Society of Person-Centered Care. Um, and, and we feel that it really needs to be brought to the forefront in understanding about the person. So not focusing on the disabilities of the individual, but understanding their hobbies and interests. Uh, so then you can make connections to the community for them or find out what, what they would be interested in with their personal support workers or so forth. Do you have any um, interesting <laughs> things that you'd like to discuss about that? Yeah, no. So I think that that leads really nicely into loneliness. So I'll take a, a tiny step back and come back to, to individual person care. Um, when we're thinking about loneliness, um, there's sort of two effects that we see with, with older people. One is social isolation and then the other is loneliness. And so just to distinguish those, social isolation is when we are somebody who lives alone, we don't engage with other people, you know, even once a month. And so that's like a, something that you can count and measure. Loneliness is a little bit trickier. It's subjective. So it's a question of do you have enough close relationships and enough um, acquaintances to make you feel supported and happy? And so this is something that wildly varies. So one person might think that they need 10 close friends and 50 acquaintances, and other people might think 10 close friends would make them crazy and that they would be so unhappy and they need three, yes. right? And so I think that it's something that it's been a little bit harder to measure and and study because you actually need to ask a bunch of questions as opposed to, you know, do you live alone, which is a very straightforward question in a sense. Um, so I think in that sense, when you start thinking about loneliness, it's it's a subjective measure. But then when we start looking into the scientific literature, the bit of research that has been done on loneliness has suggested that there's a number of reasons for it. And so when we start thinking about, well, for some people, it's that they can't actually, you know, get anywhere. So they have a transportation issue. And for other people, it's that they have a bit of social anxiety. And for other people, they just don't really have any activities that they can do things with other people. And so I think that when you're starting to think about how do we tackle loneliness, which is just a huge issue for so many people who are older, but also actually it's becoming a bigger issue throughout society. It's, it's much more, well, what is the actual sort of symptom that's what is the, what is the underlying cause here? Why is it that the, that people are feeling lonely? And that's not going to be the same for every person. And so I think that's really where we need to start thinking about this. If people have a particular reason that they're lonely, they need to address that particular reason. So it's not a one size fits all solution necessarily. No. Um, and so I think that when we start having these conversations, we need to be thinking about a conversation with an individual and a plan for an individual to then be able to start thinking about how do you how do you start addressing this feeling of loneliness um, yes. in a way that's actually going to be effective? That's right. I think we have to look at ways in doing that. And, 
you know, having more meaningful conversations as opposed to small talk where you're finding out more information about that person. Um, I do have some research. I always like to bring in some research. Uh, and this is according to the UK Social Care Institute for Excellence. Uh, social isolation is an imposed isolation from normal social networks caused by loss of mobility or deteriorating health. Isolation and loneliness, some data and research, approximately 50% of people over the age of 80 report feeling lonely. Men over the age of 80 have the highest rate of suicide rate of all groups. This is from a report on isolated seniors 2013 and 14. While in Canada, 27% of older Ontarians respondents not socially connected with others, 17% reported feeling isolated. This is from a report by Dr. Samir Sinha, working from Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, Canada, from his document, Living Longer, Living Well, in 2012. And according to The Age, UK loneliness is one of the top three concerns of older adults. Um, Tara, loneliness has been growing issue among the older population, as I discussed. Why is this, do you think? And has COVID-19 created barriers to reacting to seniors in a meaningful way? There is no clear model to address loneliness, and yet it is a huge concern, not only in England, UK, or Canada, but around the world, maybe. Yeah, so I think that there's a few things that why loneliness has become more prominent. Um, so if I talk about briefly some of the risk factors, you know, the biggest risk factors for loneliness are um, losing your spouse or losing close friends, which as you age, um, people around you do start to die. And so your social network comes away. Um, you also have life, major life events, you retire. In a lot of ways, that's a good thing. But for a lot of people, they don't realize that much of their social network and most of the people they know are that, through work. That's right. And so you suddenly yes. just don't see people every day. And you're like, oh, well, now I have to like make an effort, right? And so I think that's, just to change from what most people have had for the last, let's say, 50 years of their life or 40 years of their life. And so it is it is just an adjustment. Um, and then you have other issues that arise like disability. So if you start to lose your eyesight, suddenly you can't necessarily drive as well. Or if you have hearing impairment, there's certain, you know, certain limit, limitations or, or, or mobility impairments. So it is a question of can you actually get out to the activities that you once did? Can you still enjoy those activities? And so there's a number of risk factors. Um, and those risk factors, you know, they seem kind of consistent over time. I think why loneliness is, there's a couple of reasons I think that it's starting to become much more talked about. One is that we just all lived through lots of periods of of isolation. And so suddenly everyone knows what it feels like to be at home for long periods of time. And so I think it has started affecting a much larger um, fraction of the population. And I can come back to COVID in a minute, but I think that it really has brought the idea of loneliness and, you know, social interaction to the forefront. I think another thing is that people are much less likely to live near their families. And so this has happened over the last few generations, but kids move to different cities, they move to different countries. And so you aren't sort of in the same neighborhood as your entire extended family. And so this leads to more cases of loneliness as you, you know, as you retire or if if a spouse dies, something like that. Um, And as well, like, you know, when you're thinking about your social networks, you have these situations where if if you have um, one parent die, then maybe the other parent goes to live near one of the kids. And so then they're basically being removed from their social network that they've had for for a really long time. Could be the butcher shop that they went to or the cafe that they met their friends. Yes, they're taken out of their, their, their network and social network. Yes. Yeah. And I think that that can be really challenging for older people. And um, I think you and I were talking about this before, like remembering that like actually create making new friends and setting up a new routine takes a lot of time. Yes. And you just kind of, as you age, you forget that because you do it less frequently as you get older. Um, and so I think that for a lot of people, these, these major events um, are happening. And, um, and I think another thing is that, you know, we are just talking about it more. So mental health has come to the forefront as a discussion point and loneliness, I think really, you know, is, is an intersection with mental health. And so I think that it has just become, more um, acceptable and encouraged even to talk about these feel- mental feelings and things like that. So that's a positive thing. Um, but I think that has sort of moved it to the forefront. Um, when we start thinking about the effects of COVID, I think that it'll be interesting to see. Um, yes. So well, there's certainly. some positive effects, of course. Um, so 
so we have a bunch of older people who weren't necessarily able to interact in person with people. And, you know, interacting in person and interacting on Zoom are different. Zoom is great. Um, but I think that at the end of these past 18 months, everyone can agree it's also nice to see people in person. So, um, But I think that it, it has moved a lot of people who would have maybe not been quite so technologically savvy to being a little bit more, you know, coming online, figuring out Zoom, just so that they can interact with people because it wasn't possible for so long. So I think that, you know, the when we're talking about things like loneliness and social isolation, um, the effects of technologies are only starting to be tested, but I think there is a lot of potential for um, dealing with certain issues, not necessarily all of them, yes. but a lot of things can be more easily done. Um, and just, you know, in terms of the way that older people live, um, if you are able to check in with people regularly via technologies or into, you know, in check in with, with somebody in, in a medical profession or a healthcare profession, you know, it, it may extend the independence of people and allow them to live in their own home for longer. Lots of positive things that I think for a lot of people, maintaining their independence is a, is a key aspect and, and important. And so I think that there's a lot of technologies that may come out of this pandemic that yes. older people are more comfortable with that could be sort of positive for extending in independence and individuality into yeah. older age. That's right. I think there is a silver lining if if there is one with with COVID is that, you know, for those people that maybe couldn't get out to the social programs through community centers or church groups or whatever. Um, and now, uh, it, again, if they have the technology and they know how to use it, uh, then they're connecting through Zoom. So you could be running programs, you know, here in Toronto and perhaps people, and we have had people from the UK and New York coming on for our knitting groups or, or different programs. So that's certainly opened it up. But again, I think people need that close contact, that touch, you know, I think that's, that's really important. Um, and one of the points points that you made, I think, you know, also individuals, teenagers, I think are being affected, you know, and definitely more mental health because they're so used to going out and with their groups. So again, every, their connection has been online. So it'll be interesting how people are getting back together again and, and, yeah. and getting out. Uh, I think that is interesting. The the period in our lives that we're most lonely is actually between, you know, like our late teen and early 20s, yes. and then again after yes. 65. And these are periods that are just uh, a bit complicated, I guess, um, in terms of social interactions. And so people are a bit lonelier. And I think that um, there's a huge study that's being launched in the EU now that'll start um, at the beginning of next year looking at um, loneliness across all age groups. And right. so I think there is a lot of interesting work coming out now and loneliness is re really moving to the forefront. But I think that as a result of that, you could maybe you can think about some really interesting intergenerational things where younger people and older people are yes, interacting. Yes, are connected and um, interacting. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think that, that there's so much to offer in both directions. And I think that's a really exciting way to start thinking about this going forward. And I think your point about retired individuals is interesting. You know, they, you know, I think people have had their routine and they've built up their friendships through their co-workers. And then, as you said, once people retire, they're sort of disconnected from that. And that might have been their social network. Maybe they didn't have any other friends around or neighbors or their family lived far away. So that that is also very interesting. And, how, you know, how do those people reconnect and, and get connected to the community again? Um, yeah, I think... Yes, go ahead. I was going to say, related to that, um, when you think about um, one of the major underlying causes of... Um, or what something that an intervention that's been successful is what I should say. So a successful intervention for loneliness has actually been looking at maladaptive social skills. And so that sounds fancy. What it really means is that, you know, people get nervous when they meet new people yes. and they don't have a good reason for it. So like making friends is, is a little bit yes. nerve wracking because if you just go up and you're like, oh, let's just be friends. Like that's not something that you really do after, you know, sort of your teenage years. And so I think that you just don't realize how many of your relationships and friendships are because you worked with somebody or your kids are friends yes, or, right. you know, you know them through some activity. And so when you suddenly strip those things away, your kids move out, you're no longer going to work. You don't actually have friends of, you know, that you just sort of regularly see through other activities. And so one of the most effective ways 
when they do interventions for loneliness is to actually have an activity involved. So, you know, everyone getting together to knit or, or, you know, play ping pong or whatever it is, it doesn't matter, but at least it's something that you then aren't there just to be social, which is, you know, for a lot of people, uh, myself included, is just like, oh, wow, now I'm here to meet people and chat with them. And, you know, that's, that's a, a, a trickier situation. Yeah, it, it takes a bit of time. I mean, you know, we, we all live uh, busy lives. And, you know, to keep your friendships up, because you don't want your friends to drop off. So, you know, you have to do your part in connecting or saying, okay, come on over for dinner or come, let's meet at a cafe. Um, So I do have some, you know, I guess, uh, some other research by Robin Dunbar, which is a British anthropologist. And he states that social networks are very important, as we were talking about. And failure to see a friend for six months or so leaves us feeling less emotionally attached to them, causing them to drop down through a person's network. So that's basically what what we were talking about. Um, uh, And I think, you know, can you provide a little bit more on the social networks and uh, perhaps a little bit about social prescribing? Because that is certainly, um, you know, you're hearing doctors talk about it. Perhaps social workers are now doing a bit more on social prescribing. So making sure that people are connected to different groups or hobbies or interests. So I'd like to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, so I know a bit less about social prescribing, but I'll start with social networks. Um, So when we think about things like when we're talking about loneliness, there's two aspects of it. One is having a number of close friends. And these are people that you really rely on. They know the details. They warts in all kind of situation where you're, you know, people that you're closest to, um, which is often members of your family and then a, a couple of very close friends. And then there's the second aspect, which is your larger social network. And this is a really critical aspect that I think, you know, people don't discuss quite as often. But having lots of different places like you know you do you do knitting on on monday and then on wednesdays you go to a particular like sporting class or something like that and so having lots of different networks like that means that when something happens in your life you know if you need advice on this or that you kind of you know can ask this network and that network and it's it sort of keeps you connected to the community in a social fabric kind of way and you feel like a part of the community and then you also have things to offer to the community when when you're the person who happens to know a bit about what someone else in your community needs. And so a key part of that is is having sort of an extensive social network that you that are plugged in in a number of ways. And that's where I think that with aging it can get tricky is that if your whole social network is through work and then you retire suddenly the whole thing's dropping out whereas if you also have you know a sporting activity or um, some sort of social group or some sort of volunteerism work that you're doing it doesn't even it doesn't matter at all what it is but just different aspects where you have different people that are sort of these loose people that you know you know their names you know a bit about them you definitely chat when you see them, but it's not like you're having dinner with them, you know, every second week. That Those types of networks and making those extensive is also really key to not feeling lonely and feeling sort of a, an important part of the community. Yes. And so those both of those are, are critical. Um, and I think that, you know, when we're thinking about social prescribing or getting people out there, it's, it's also, you know, which of these are you lacking? Because I think that there are some people who are really good at one or the other, and, and both of them have been shown to have to be really critical for aging. I mean, loneliness is a risk factor for mortality um, that's similar to being completely physically inactive or being um, extremely overweight. So it's a, it's a huge risk factor. And the different types of um, networks, so if you have too small of a network or you don't have enough close friends, then that's going to be risks for different types of aging-related things. So it's really critical to have both sets of those networks. Yes. I can give an example of that, and I think we discussed it in our last uh, phone call, um, which is my aunt from the UK who still lives at home. She's quite independent. And so I had a conversation and and actually did tape her about talking about social networks. And what she's done is actually she has different groups of friends, all different ages, which is quite unique. And I mean, it's taken her years to do this. She's got her neighbors that she can call on. She even has some younger individuals in their 40s that will pick her up and take her out to a cafe or a musical or whatever. So she does stress that that is important to have the social networks to help you or for conversation or somebody that she could call on on the phone just to have a conversation if if she can't get out Um, so I think that I think that's quite unique in what she has set up 
And I just want to uh, talk about the work that is being done on loneliness and social isolation. The International Federation on Aging on their Global Cafe on August the 6th actually featured Dr. Christopher Minkton uh, from Geneva, who works with the WHO, World Health Organization. And the WHO is working on a study of social isolation and loneliness project, well, which will, I guess, last for about three to five years. Uh, implementation of evidence-based research, clear recommendations and living guidelines and strategies is what they wanted to look on. Uh, we need a call to action and future development on this issue, including mental health, isolation, loneliness, and ages. Um, before we end the conversation with Tara today, I would like to make mention of the late uh, Professor John Cacchiopo on loneliness, and maybe Tara may have some input as well after I finish this. Social connection requires us to think of another person. Loneliness is like a hunger. It is a sign to become socially engaged. Loneliness is stubborn. Professor Kakiopo gave some advice on the acronym of EASE, E-A-S-E, which I added and discuss in our many Mosaic presentations in the community. So E is for slowly ease your way back in to social groups if you haven't been for a long time. Um, A, have an action plan. So what would you like to do throughout the week? Do you have connection to your friends that you'd like to see? Or perhaps going to a special program or a special program on Zoom? Find out about people and their meaning. Have meaningful conversations rather than small talk. S. Seek people with similar interests to meet up with. So people might have the same hobbies as you. Then that would start a conversation, maybe interest uh, programs that you could attend together. And E. Expect the best. Warm up to what we present to the world. And lastly, Tara, do you have any takeaway messages for our listeners today or any of the information that I have provided above? Yeah, so I'll first comment on the ease, which I really love as a um, sort of an approach is that, you know, when you do start to, if you don't have enough social interaction um, at any phase in your life and you want to increase that, you know, it's it will take time. It takes time to get to know people. And I think remembering and remembering that and being relaxed about it and recognizing that as you you join a new group or meet some new people, you know, it takes a while to get to know people. And so it, it will get better with time. Um, and I think as well, you know, expecting the best is, is really a key thing. You know, most people are, are, are not thinking negative things. And it's very easy if you're a little bit nervous to, to get a little bit of anxiety surrounding social interactions, which is indeed why, as we were mentioning earlier, so many of these activities where you're Thing. It gives you something to talk about. It's it's something that, yes. that gives you a bit of confidence in getting started. So yes. I think that's great. And 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 loneliness is a really you know it's a it's a huge driver. And you know from an evolutionary perspective, you know humans survived for a long time because they worked in groups. So it's it's really at the core of our being that we want to be around other people. Um, and so it's not just for social interactions, but it's it was a survival thing for a very yes. long time. So this is just a very normal feeling. Um, so if you're feeling like lonely, it's a, it's a motivator to get out there and, and do something about it. Um, and yeah, so the last takeaway message is, you know, this is something that you can start, you know, if you're thinking about healthy aging and you're thinking about keeping your social networks going, this is something that you can start getting in the practice of at any phase of life. And so if you've waited until you're 70, you know, today's the best day to start. And if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, starting to think about like, how do I expand my social networks? How can I meet people of different ages? How can, yeah. you know, that expand the activities that I do or the people I know? Um, that's a good thing to just get in the habit of because then as you get to, to older age, you're going to have this extensive social fabric that you then are able to, you know, dip in and out of where you want to, you know, engage this way or engage that way. And it's just a, a very positive thing for people's lifestyles. Ah, oh, well, thank you for that. And Tara, it was a real pleasure getting to know you. I know we've had quite a number of conversations leading up to this podcast, but, uh, you know, and thank you for your research with regards to isolation and loneliness. And again, thank you to our listeners who have joined this podcast. Our next guest for the fall will be Kristen Bartlett, who is Artistic Program Manager of the Batov Method.
The Batov Method is a warm, collaborative, and creative virtual art space classes that enrich seniors' minds. So this is um, a program which you can access on Zoom. And classes include music, songwriting, visual arts, creative movement, creative writing, poetry, drama, sing-alongs, and more. And this will be released for September 2021. So stay tuned. And thank you again, Tara. Bye for now. Thank you.